The House of Morell was open in the Yorkshire city of Hull in England between 1938 and 1978 and during that time the city was full of small retail outlets selling ladies clothes and accessories each having a style and culture of their own. Shoppers going in and out of its centre gave Mirel a particular reputation amongst the others, like the shop called Irene Leonard that you'll see in the locations video, and Noel's Fashions, a small ladies outfitters opposite City Hall, owned by Bobby Levine, who you see here talking to Molly Kidd and her husband Jimmy in this photo. In Hull, Social connections like these made business work, particularly at the House of Morell, where you didn't have to be recommended by existing clients to shop there, but it was often your social standing or ability to pay that got you through the door. People who knew it thought Morell was posh, very, very posh. And in Hull, if you were seen with one of its bags, you'd really arrived. It was a status symbol, as well as showing you had great fashion sense. But clients like Maisie Parks, Neil's mum, who became Lady Parks in 1971 when her husband Basil was knighted by the Queen, felt it was their sanctuary. Their requirements met in a place where money was no object and their needs were understood. It was not by accident that Morel had an exclusive reputation, enhanced by the fashions sold there, but also by Molly, Mira and the showroom girls, who we'll meet as we go along. Showroom girls is what they called each other back net then and still do now. But first let's get to know Molly. The showroom was overseen by director and figurehead Mira Mountain. It was her gravitas that brought in clients, friends in her social circle, high profile ladies like Maisie Parks who attracted attention to what they wore and when. Affectionately known as Mirrors, she ran it with crystal clear vision and she and manager Molly Kidd led from the front. If you want to know more about Mirror Mountain, watch the locations where you'll meet her in person. It's linked in the description box below. It's very unusual to find a photo of Molly like this one, as she was said to hate having her photo taken, unlike Bobby, who was comfortable on stage or on camera, and in the late 60s and 70s often commed, that means the person who narrates and gives audience information, at Mirelle's fashion shows. We'll hear more about fashion shows as we go along. Molly had a strong personality and was originally from Manchester, about 100 miles away from Hull. Described as the backbone of the shop by showroom staff, she inspired a mix of terror, respect and admiration from colleagues and clients. Molly became Mirelle's manager in the early 50s and also had a key role to play in bridging between the showroom and the workroom, the place the seamstresses worked. Subscribe for updates and you'll see immediately when the workroom talk is live, which contains lots of detail about the sewing they did there. A softer, kinder person. As a duo, Mira and Molly were usually present at Morel, but they weren't models. And although Mira's warm and friendly personality brought people through the door, they needed ladies on the shop floor who could greet customers, model clothes and sell. Welcoming in this exclusive environment, the showroom girls attended to their clients' wishes. They advised, dealt with transactions, suggested outfits and modelled what was on sale. They were sales ladies, but were not only there to handle clothes and money. Crucially, they built relationships with clients in a manner said to be like personal shopping today or clothing the royals, said one showroom girl. And in Hull, there were women we'll meet, like Neil Park's mum and his sister Angela, who were a bit like the royal family in the area and had a similar need to be clothed. 
Showroom girls didn't hold a formal qualification for working there, except for modelling, which you'll find out about as well as who trained where. But the demands of such an environment also required intelligence, fashion nous, style and people skills, as well as knowing the clients intimately to be expert at her job. Mira's theatrical background played out in creating this side of the business. It was almost her stage, welcoming clients into her front of house like it was a theatre, and she had a keen eye for presentation and what French fashion houses did, actively copying their style. Exclusively employing women throughout its 40 years, no men worked in the sales arm at the House of Morel. Mira's husband, Percy, had his name jointly over the door in 1952, but it was really owned by Mira. And long after she became the only director and Percy wasn't involved, in the 60s, Molly took a portion of the shares to own the company as well. They were powerful women in the retail sector in Hull. Their menfolk not involved except as husbands and partners. And as you can see, Jimmy Kidd went to social occasions with his wife Molly, dressed in black tie, a style of dress you'll hear about in the locations. Bill is in this fun photo of the showroom girls taken in November 1964, getting ready for a fashion show on a Nordic cross-channel ferry. He was one of the men very much in the background to the work the women carried out, which was described entirely as Mira's baby, her concern. Mira's husband Percy, Jimmy and Bill, as well as the girls' boyfriends, went round in a crowd and were often in and out of the shop. In these photos, you see men dressed traditionally in comparison with the glittering glamour of their partner's evening outfits. Do you think expectations of men's clothing was different from women's in the 60s? Let us know in the comments below. The shop floors at the House of Morel always look quite similar to this picture of Sue Eggleston modelling a wedding gown in Story Street around 1960 in a publicity shop to put in the paper, she said. You can see more of their shops in the locations talk. It was here that they dealt with customers, clients, orders and sales, and the wording of those who walk through their doors is significant. Customers were women like you and me, who'd saved up for something special for an important occasion, like a wedding or gala ball or holiday, but women with accounts like Maisie Parks were clients, and in photos like the ones you're going to see here, when out and about at important occasions, clients were almost definitely wearing items bought from the House of Mirel. They provided a regular income and had an intimate, ongoing relationship with the shop and it with them. Arriving from all over Hull and East Riding, the county around the city, as well as Lincolnshire to the south, many were well-known high-profile names and for Lightowler, Hollingberry and Needler, amongst many others, it was an assured surface that greeted them, extremely expensive as well. To them, the Morel showroom stood out in the landscape. Their hand-picked apparel and exclusivity was obvious, but it wasn't only about them. The girls also became well-known due to the relationships they developed and the public aspect to their work. Partly because of talent, partly visibility, Partly because Mirel was an incredible place with a top-notch reputation, they were not anonymous. For those like Maureen Norris, seen here in 1960, whose father was a newspaper salesman, calling out the evening edition on the streets of Hull, it was considered a step up to work there, something Mira was acutely aware of, often taking them under her wing and wanting the best for them in life, like marrying the right person, in her opinion. And like her, there were, they were individuals in their own right, often but not always coming from well-known families around Hull. Mira liked personality, said one, 
as if she was assembling a cast, wanting interesting girls around her in the shop, and another said their character helped sales. This recruitment strategy also contributed to Mirelle's culture, its atmosphere, customs and behaviours, and it was felt by the customers and clients who shop there, and the office and workroom staff as well. Selecting the right showroom girl brought success to the business, and because of that, staff had to be fine-tuned to suit, as we'll find out later on when Maureen Gregory started in Carmichael's in the 70s, so stay tuned. Very much at the forefront of Mira's mind was style, intelligence and personality, which each of the girls had in abundance. Whether training them up on the job or bringing them in from other retailers, Peggy Wilson joined Mirelle from Edwin Davis department store around the corner on Bond Street in Hull, for instance. Their work assured that Mirelle made money. You can see a picture of Edwin Davis before it was demolished on the House of Mirelle website under the page Read or type Edwin Davis into the search bar. Their work was important. Before the workroom girls, milliners and outworkers dealt with alterations that we'll talk about more in the workroom introduction coming up, it was the people in the showroom who generated sales. Do you think retail staff today have the same sort of job as the showroom girls back then? Let us know in the comments below. The showroom had a hierarchy with Mira and Molly at the top and the girls held formal positions, first, second, third sales, as well as juniors who were entry-level school leavers and trainees on the job. Clients knew the showroom girls by name and were matched with their positions. First sales, like Olga Fay you see here in a photo from around 1950, served Lady so-and-so, the wife of a business owner served by the second, but each client had their favourites and as they got to know each other it was also the other way round. The girls were paid commission, a good customer meant they earned money on each sale, adding to their personal income and salary, and the more expensive the item, the more commission they earned, as Mirelle's bookkeeper Betty Kitching, called Kitch by the girls, knew very well. Knowing a client was essential, and social connections mattered too. Like personal shopping, aspects of their lives were confided and trusted. All their idiosyncrasies, social lives and plans were brought through the door, which ladies like Maisie Parks wouldn't do with just anyone. Molly Kidd was said to have an encyclopedic memory for who was going to what social occasion and what ladies bought from the shop so as not to duplicate outfits and when Hilary Needler handed the racing trophy in her name to jockey Lester Piggott in this picture she was probably dressed by Mirelle wearing a hat to match her impeccably designed and made coat that they would have promised no one else would be seen in when she asked for something new. Tact and discretion like this were integral to the level of custom and the ladies they served expected nothing less. All the women who shopped at Mirelle had varied commitments and relationships as well as the need to be clothed and inside the showroom they found a professional, helpful friendship with a deference, efficiency and care that was unparalleled in Hull for miles around in what was called the county, meaning places like the East Riding of Yorkshire. Customers trusted Mirelle because it sourced clothes hard to find anywhere in Yorkshire or Lincolnshire on the other side of the Humber and in turn the showroom staff responded to the people they knew, calling clients when they thought they might like a new hat, coat or gown. Through keeping items to one side and buying clothes into the shop with particular people in mind, trust grew and that generated sales. Even if the client or customer preferred a dress in a different size, the skirt tighter or the hem raised, 
the partnership between the showroom and the workroom meant their seamstresses took on board any alterations needed, giving the client exactly what they wanted on each shopping trip to town. You'll hear about how important the workroom was in our next introduction, so do subscribe and click the bell notification icon and tell us, what's the most treasured outfit in your wardrobe? And did you pick it out yourself or have help making the decision like the showroom girls did every day with their clients? Let us know in the comments below. Back in the beginning of Mirelle, two years before the war, ready to wear was secondary to making clothes. Dressmaker Betty Sykes describing Mirelle's customers as having clothes designed and made by the workroom. One of the reasons why in-house mannequins were employed from opening in autumn 1938 and also why Christine Edwards was after the war. She was a designer trained at Hull College of Art. Here you see her changing the window at 60 King Edward Street in July 1950, while dark-haired, glamorous workroom girl Rita looks on, wearing a light summery dress with bolero to match, very different from the striped suit in the window. At this point, and from opening, mannequins like little Val, Valerie Beardshall, who was employed in 1950 at the same time, displayed clothes in person and on demand, including those made for customers. In 1940, a decade earlier, at the beginning of the war, adverts show there were models direct from Paris on sale, which doesn't mean a mannequin. Models were one-off examples of clothes sold directly from Paris, the centre of fashion, as well as Britain, and particularly dress firms based in London. The word meant an example, a bit like a prototype, and businesses like Mirelle saw them, then ordered ones to be made up using a customer's measurements. The fashion industry was complicated as a result and in 1940 they had a gown buyer to manage all aspects of purchasing clothes for sale. Her name was Rita Tassell, who isn't the same Rita as in the window. Seen here in the 60s, walking to a wedding, dressed up to the nines, Rita's job as the gown buyer was very specific, someone who zoomed down to London on the train from Paragon Station, attending wholesale fashion houses on behalf of the business, selecting items that were bought in order to be sold, including already made clothes called ready to wear, and attending fashion weeks if invited, once they started in the 50s too. Being a gown buyer involved an in-depth knowledge of fashion and trends, sound business sense and an ability to match item to customer, something that lasted throughout the lifetime of Mirelle. Despite the business immediately taking off after it was established in 1938, World War II brought an end to Rita's job when she left the business for good. From then on, it was carried out by Mira, and from the mid-50s, herself and Molly Kidd, who travelled the length and breadth of Britain to select outfits, accessories and furs, as well as buying from stockists in Hull too. By then, Jean Muir, the British fashion designer who worked for brands like Jaeger, had coined a phrase to describe clothes that she termed good quality, well-made clothes for middle-class women to wear, and her term that stuck was wholesale couture. In the 70s, Molly and Mira still did the buying, sometimes taking along a younger member of staff, and that included Judith, the salon's first sales, and as a duo or trio, they'd attend some of the most well-known brands of couture, ready-to-wear, and wholesale couture. There, they'd be shown collections for the new season, choosing for clients that, once delivered, would be given to the showroom to model and sell. Buying was the heartbeat of the business. Without exceptional connections to designers, fashion houses and creators, and a fashion industry that was thriving, Mirelle would have failed. 
Over 40 years, buying didn't stay the same. Differing in the staff who did it, the focus of what was selling and available stock, changing in line with the business and fashion, which you'll see in the fashions talk coming up if you subscribe. What are the biggest changes you've seen to fashion in your lifetime? Let us know in the comments below. Before 1950, fashion models like Little Val were called mannequins and using that word refers to a very particular era in the shop from 1938 to around the end of 51 when it meant being an in-house model long before social media and the supermodels we know today although some were well known as we'll see later on. But whether a model or a mannequin, being well presented was an integral part of working in the showroom and the girls wore clothes sourced by Morel whilst at work or in formal, highly organised public fashion shows like this one which took place in Hull in September 1961. Here, social connections mattered too, as you can see, because Angie Snelling, daughter of Maisie Parks, joined in as a volunteer model, as it was known by then, for fun, which means no payment. She's alongside showroom girl Sue, who you probably recognise, and Mary Johnson on the right, booked freelance for this occasion, who came from a place called Burton Pidsey outside Hull. They're modelling clothes that were available for purchase, as well as furs, and Sue's wearing a hat with a wide picture-style rim, which you'll learn more about in the fashions. They bought their own accessories to wear, like shoes. Although Hull had many farriers, like Silver's farriers, who supplied Morel with furs around 1957, as you can see, Nobel furs or noble furs were worn in this show and by gum they were expensive as well as created especially for the House of Morel. In the first photo that started this talk, Molly's wearing a white fur stole and the time, 1965, makes it consistent with it being a noble fur which would have been expensive for her too, although perhaps bought at cost price discount as she worked in the shop. Mirelle ran at least two external fashion shows a year from 1946 to about 1976 and usually the ticket price was sold in aid of charity and Mira's theatrical background was a perfect match for delivering them. Her signature ran all the way through. They staged some of the most high-profile shows in Hull and East Riding. The girls talk fondly about travelling by the Lincoln Castle ferry, the wind whipping up their hair across the Humber to Lincolnshire, or piling into a car to ride away from the city to places like Driffield near Sledmere Hall, which you can see in the locations. But they also did big shows which they sold tickets for at Hull's Guildhall and City Hall, as you can see from this programme cover for a show shortly after the one earlier called An International Fantasia of Fashion in October 1961. Mirelle's reputation stretched far and wide. It was, it was no exaggeration that people of fame and fortune came from miles around to shop there. Like Pat Bredin, the Hull-born singer, for instance, who was probably a friend of Mirrors and might even have been trained by her in the West End Studio Stage School. And she was seen in the audience of Mirelle's fashion shows. Do you think she's wearing Morel in this picture from a bit after 1957 when she represented the UK in the Eurovision Song Contest? It's possible she was. Let us know in the comments below. They also travelled to Cutler's Hall in Sheffield and Yorkshire's Sledmere Hall where this photo was taken. One showroom girl calling it their largest, biggest and most flamboyant fashion show. It was held at Sir Richard and Lady Sykes' house, a stately home which was also a stud that bred horses in February 1963 and is now known as Sledmere House and open to the public if you want to go and explore yourself. The link is below. 
In the midst of the big freeze, a too long period of cold, snowy weather, at the beginning of 1963, they lined up on the terrace outside, a mixture of showroom girls and models. Sue Eggleston, as well as dark-haired freelance model Mary, and you can get a feel for the clothes they were selling too. Zenobia Taranko, an ash blonde whose filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock would have liked, was also there that day, another showroom girl who started in the 50s. Like Hull itself, where many visited or emigrated from all over Europe, Zenobia was originally a Polish refugee who came to Hull escaping the war. And this lady, from a much earlier photo in March 1945, is Teresa Aviti. The shop called her Spanish Teresa or Terry, and she came to Hull as a refugee during the Spanish Civil War in the late 30s, before working at Mirel in the showroom, selling clothes before Zenobia joined. From this photo, you can see it was a mixture of characters and looks, sizes and ages, as well as the continental touch from Teresa, Zenobia and others that set off clothes just right and ultimately they always sold. What do you think of the gowns they're modelling? Do you recognise any of the designs from this photo? We don't have a record of who made these gorgeous dresses, but they weren't Mirel makes who stopped making clothes more than a decade before. Contact us through our website or comment below if you have any suggestions. The one on the left with the black bow looks particularly like a famous gown by Christian Dior, for instance. We'd love to hear from you. Big shows aside, from 1946, Mirelle regularly staged them in aid of charity at the New York Hotel on Annaby Road, which you can read a blog post about on the House of Mirelle website. Look for it under the page Read or type in the New York Hotel into its search bar. Such was the quantity of modelling carried out. Girls were professionally trained at places like Michelle's Mannequins in Leeds, a train ride away in another Yorkshire city, which set up a branch in Hull by September 1952. Or they went to the Werner Crosley Modelling School, who had young Valerie Beardshall as a trainee travelling from her hometown of Pontefract, aged 12. At 15 in 1950... She worked full-time for Morel for about 18 months before leaving to choose a different career. Before she did, she modelled for some photos around this time, including this one at the Ferrens Art Gallery, where you see her in a stripy suit by what was described as a good make Hebe Sports that also looks similar to the one Christine Edwards was arranging in the King Edward Street window, Stripes, a fabric trend in the early 50s, also used by Simon Massey, another British brand. In the photo, you can see another Hebe suit, as the showroom girls called it, in the 1949 collections, which has exactly the same pattern and pocket detail as the one Val's wearing, the season later choosing a different fabric but the same design. By November 1951, the salon was in a newly extended space behind the shop floor at number 60 King Edward Street. Upstairs was the office for the director and admin staff. Shows called mannequin parades were held as they had been in Albion Street, which you can hear about in the locations. They arranged for extra special clients to see stock after hours, something they carried on doing throughout the time they were open, even in Carmichael's, where the girls dressed hurriedly but carefully behind the scenes, then walked for guests padding on carpets through the closed store. Famous models joined them on catwalks for public fashion shows, Seignon, the most well-known, a model for Christian Dior, whose real name was San Yin Nistrom or Madame Seignon. From 1946, she mixed with mannequins and showroom girls like Big Val Valerie Bat and Little Val Valerie Beardshall, who was employed specifically to model clothes, no selling, 
but other staff volunteered on the catwalks also, as well as being roped in, some better at it than others. Little Val recalling one person walking with her arms out stiffly, going in the wrong direction, a bit like doing a march or a robot. Have you tried to move like a fashion model? Did you find it easy? Let us know in the comments below. Such was the need for models and mannequins in the area. Mirelle set up a charm school, another word for a place where you trained in deportment, makeup, exercise and modelling, which was said to be in the building opposite the electricity showroom on Ferrens Way. It opened in January 1949 and first sales Olga Fay was the chief trainer very experienced by this point and a key person in the showroom from around 1946 to about 1954 when she left quickly and sharply for offending a rich client, then emigrated to Canada with her husband. We don't know when its charm school ended, but memories of it suggest that it was before 1952 and applicants were judged quite harshly as to their suitability to model. If you know where the charm school was opposite the electricity showroom, please do leave us a comment below. And if you want to find out more about the history of modelling, scoot over to House of Morel UK website and find the blog called Hull Fashion History, Modelling in Hull between the 1930s and 1950s and Modelling Today. Let us know if you enjoyed the trip down memory lane in the comments. Between 1938 and 1941, at both 6 Albion Street and Studio 5 of the Church Institute, they would have had an area to meet and greet those wanting clothes made for them, and their showroom and workroom staff attended to them before sewing clothes they'd designed themselves, like the one Christine Edwards also created, which will be in the Fashions Talk. Inside Morel gowns, there would be an area where mannequins showed items created by the design arm and those and ready to wear would have been modelled together. Girls walking up and down with underwater slowness, grace and poise, turning occasionally to show how it looked from the side or taking off a coat to display what, what it was teamed with to the women who watched like an audience in a theatre or cinema. The workroom was prominent in this time frame, the overlap between it and the showroom more explicit. Ready to wear was secondary to the dressmaking arm and across Paris and in London's Mayfair, couture houses worked the same way as Morel gowns. Opulent areas of exclusivity and design, mannequins like Olga walked in single file showing models gliding across deep carpets like moving statues holding numbers in their hands. When she opened the House of Morel, Mira aspired to the continental approach and would have created the same. Jill Bradley, owner of Halton Grey Modelling School and Agency, and a model herself from the 60s onwards, particularly remembered the way models had to glide across the floor smoothly so as not to look awkward or distract attention from the clothes. Sue, showroom girl in the late 50s to the mid 60s, said of Morel, it was really a salon, meaning a place similar to what would be found in Mayfair, where one-off exclusive items were personally displayed to clients, although not as expensive or intensive as the haute couture we know today that could run into thousands and thousands of pounds. In the 30s, it was expected that well-to-do women had clothes made for them, said Betty, of the work she carried out in the workroom. But by the 60s, those expectations had changed with mass production in the wake of Mary Quant, which you can hear about in the locations and in the fashions coming up soon. Do you think modelling has changed much since then? Um, what are the main differences between then and now? Let us know in the comments below. Important between 1938 and 1949, selling and displaying clothes changed focus at Mirel between 1950 and 51. 
In 1950, Little Val came to Mirelle, aged 50, primarily as a mannequin, she said. But when she left a year and a half later, they didn't need a dedicated model showing the, showing the change in focus to the way fashion was displayed and sold. A decade later, 21-year-old Sue went to London to the famous Lucy Clayton, who trained models like Jean Shrimpton, known as the Shrimp, and in the 70s, 16-year-old Maureen Gregory, who is a different person from Maureen Norris, trained at Holt and Gray, the local modelling school and agency, established by another name well known to the history of fashion in Hull, like Bobby, Mirror and Molly. A contemporary of Mirror's, Nancy Holt and Gray, had been a fashion buyer for Thornton Farley's department store and established her training school when she saw that local ladies were coming up in the world, meaning they might be the wives of suddenly successful local businessmen. And she thought that they needed a place to understand what cutlery to use and what to wear as well. When Maureen Gregory trained 12 or so years later, the company had changed to purely training models and it was sold by Nancy to local girls Shirley Coates and Jill Bradley in the late 60s. You can see examples of Shirley's lookbook here, a tremendously successful model, alongside business partner Jill. Maureen Gregory worked solely at Carmichael's, which you can find out about in the locations, and did not model clothes in-house unless it was for in-house fashion shows with private invitations, an example of which you see here from Story Street before decimalisation happened in 1971, although it's likely this card was talking about an external public fashion show with tickets at five shillings, a shilling being 5p in Old Sterling. When Little Val was in post between 1950 and 51, modelling was considered to be as essential to selling in the everyday workings of the shop and that reflected the in-person nature of displaying clothes and accessories that was part of Mineral's culture and what it was known for. A lot of Hull stores like Thornton Farley's or Hammond's or Marvin's Fashion House who bought Mineral in 1978 also stage shows where Mary had lots of experience, for instance. You can find out about those shops in the locations. But those who went to them or modelled at them said none of them were like the ones people flocked to by the House of Morel, which were incredible for the way they were stage managed and the clothes on display. At an international fantasia of fashion in October 1961, Ballroom dancers danced along the catwalk and the famous TV tenor Enrico Nobel sung his lilting, swooning songs. Mr Nobel was also a furrier and owned what was from the early 60s called Noble Furs, misspelled in the write-up of the earlier fashion show where Sue modelled one of his dyed violet mink coats as Nobel Furs. It's worth an extraordinary amount of money if you look at the equivalent today. If you've watched the locations, you'll know this picture. But can you tell what fur Mira and her friend are wearing at a Rosa Ski Resort? Do you think it might be the same as you see in this 1963 advert for Noble Furs? Let us know in the comments below. Not all girls in the showroom were trained as conventional models or were model tall. Some, like Maureen Norris, who you see in this picture from 1960, or Tanya Bishop, starting in the early 50s, were around 5 foot 3, the average height for a British woman at that time. Tanya said she didn't like the experience of being on the catwalk and really wanted to be tall after being roped into model when she was in the shop in the early 50s. There at the same time, Maureen Norris felt differently, really enjoying it, saying she was the smallest in comparison with people like Zenobia and Sue, who towered over her at five foot ten. And in 1968, after Maureen left and had long been first sales, Jackie Weinberg joined the showroom under five foot eight too. 
Style and personality was more important instead of going to modelling school. And Maureen, Tanya and Jackie learned on the job. They had potential. A key element in Mira's hiring to look good on the catwalk or in photographs, build relationships with clients, know fashion and wear it well. Some started young. The average age of a junior from the young set, which is what teenagers like little Val were called in the 40s and early 50s before the word teenager was in use, was dependent on school leaving age. Girls left school aged 14 in the years until 1944, which included mannequins like Olga Fay and also Molly Kidd, 15 afterwards, and 16 after 1974. First and second sales, like Sue Eggleston or Margaret Everingham, who we see in the photo from 1964, were usually in their teens to mid-twenties, although older women, mothers or grandmothers known as matrons, were employed, like Louise, who was a freelance model billed as Our Own Mrs Exeter by Mirror when she narrated an international fantasia of fashion in October 1961. The age ranges helped selling. Working at Mirelle in the 50s and 60s, Big Val, Valerie Bat, who you see in this picture, was in her 30s. Little Val got her nickname from being there at the same time. Peggy Wilson and Betty Stone joined in the 50s and 60s and stayed as they aged. But Peggy Wilson left in mid-1967 when her husband's job at Outred and Harrison, a firm well known in the city and so dependent on Hull's economy, started to falter. They moved to Wales for his new job. Like friends coming to visit, staff who stayed in the city or returned from where they'd moved to, like Sue Eggleston, who left her job at Morel and Hull by 1967 to model in the Caribbean, remained loyal to the shop appearing at shows when they came back to visit, some doing so when they left to focus on the home, like Big Val did, returning to help out or work shorter hours. But it wasn't all plain sailing. After she got married in 1957, Big Val's new husband, Eric, disapproved of her staying there. Her daughter suggesting his attitudes were chauvinistic. Eric thought it was a fast atmosphere, meaning the ladies had too much of the wrong sort of fun for his new wife, Val, to be safe. In the 60s, the showroom girls had a reputation amongst some in Hull as being party girls, a snooty phrase meaning up for the wrong sort of good time. But most of them describe a wonderful life working there with strong friendships like that between Mary, Sue, June Barkworth, a freelance model, and Anne Hesk, who travelled everywhere to go modelling and their adventures were fun and nothing to be frowned upon or that extreme. In the 1970s, while they were at Carmichael's and now a decade older, Betty Stone returned to be described as a grandmotherly presence for the younger showroom girls like Maureen Gregory. Clients and customers were also different ages and when they walked into Morel or La Boutique, which was Morel's budget store you can learn about in the locations, they were served by women they could relate to, which was important for making sales. Mothers coming in with their daughters were advised by people who identified with their ages and fashion tastes as well. The daughters buying one thing, the mothers another, both served in Carmichael's in the 70s across both sides of the dividing aisle. Do you think daughters wear the same as their mums these days? Or is fashion more clearly defined between the young and old? Let us know in the comments below. Attending social occasions themselves really helped their jobs. Judith Tinney often saw her clients and customers at social occasions, who was first sales in the 70s while they were at Carmichael's. Sue Eggleston attended events like the annual Holderness Hunt Ball, or as Molly did in the first photo by being invited to Neil Park's 21st. 
they could visualize the event the client would need clothes for and thought carefully about what would be required black tie for instance which we talk about in the locations but they also considered the person herself and what was held in stock before suggesting something to suit in the salon nothing was on display items were brought to customers in fitting rooms behind black drapes suspended from the ceiling and pulled round on rails like the one in the photo of story street so no one knew or saw what was going on staff knew each item exactly and not only that molly knew who else was wearing what in the city she had excellent recall style and stock control one item was bought by the house of morel in a particular collection from a designer in turn the designer assured it was not stocked close by meaning that no one else would own it which added to its exclusivity and and picked for an event they were buying for and through tact and taste, Mirelle supplied and shaped their clients' wardrobes. Hullen East Riding was described as a village by many, something people still say of the city today. Observing women were interconnected in the middle and upper classes and Mirelle assured there wasn't duplication amongst them, an unforgivable faux pas. It was only from mid-1960 when La Boutique opened that clothes were available for customers to browse, try on and take to the till, which was called off the peg. And we talk about in the locations, but they were still of very good quality from excellent labels. All others in Story Street were hidden away, stored in packing boxes, hung behind curtains or screens and presented to clients. Staff at La Boutique, the Budget store on Anne Libby Road under the Cecil Cinema were more relaxed in the way they sold to customers, a younger, funkier store, but there was still an all pervading sense of excellence found throughout the house of Mirelle. Check out the locations to find out more about La Boutique if you haven't done so already. And we'll be looking more at fashions in a video coming up, so don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification icon to be told. Customers recalled the Story Street staff particularly as tall or beautiful, striking women. During this era, many well-known women worked in the salon, their names familiar to clients and customers or attendees at Morel's fashion shows like Sue, Peggy Wilson, Maureen Norris and Zenobia Taranko in the 50s, in the 60s Margaret Everingham who's in the 1964 photo, and in the early 60s, in age 14, Lynn Hardman, who modelled Frank Usher for Morel in a new publication in Hull called Groove Magazine in 67, also joined. If you go to House of Morel UK and type in Frank Usher into the search bar, you can see one of his silk caftans as an example of that sort of thing. Jackie Weinberg, Honor Dufton, Elizabeth Crichton and Veronica were often publicised like famous models, Seignon, using only their first or unmarried names, Jackie, Honor, Elspeth. And if they were out and about on its social circuit, standards of presentation were essential, particularly if you worked at the House of Morel. Perfectly groomed and dressed for the time of day, they wore cocktail dresses for drinks, full-length gowns for dinner dances, hats and gloves, sometimes bought straight from the packing room where glossy boxes were delivered from all over the world. Modelling was a full-time occupation outside of working hours often and even when off duty they looked the part which fitted the morals and accepted dress codes in Hull as you will see in the locations. Lipstick, the right hairdo, perfect grooming. It was unthinkable that they could be seen out in Hull and East Ryden looking a fright. You wouldn't go out to post a letter without your glory on, said Jill Bradley model and owner of model agency Holton Gray of wearing makeup and doing her hair in the 60s and 70s. Women 
were expected to present and clothe themselves according to these rules, especially if they worked in the fashion industry. And in the 50s and early 60s, time of day dressing was adhered to without exception, meaning following the social expectations of where you were attending. A six o'clock dress or a travelling outfit, for instance, or an evening gown for the Holderness Hunt Ball. Showroom girls had access to the most desirable clothing in Hull, paying them off from their wages at cost price week by week on the drip. Often to the consternation of Betty Kitching, who calculated their payroll and commission and knew how much would be left if they borrowed too much. Connections mattered in modelling too, as it was natural to book people that Mira and Molly knew, like Sue's friend Mary Johnson. And when Betty's daughter Carol became a photographic model, she joined in with everyone else in a fashion show in 1967 on the Sparrow, a roll-on, roll-off ferry in Hull's docks, which you can see something about in the locations too. In the 60s, after Mary Quant appeared, Fashion divided between young and old. Young and fashion conscious, Mo West, another Maureen, walked at La Boutique in the early 1960s, recalling Catherine Worsley's wedding at York Minster on the 8th of June 1961 because the dress was designed by Couturier John Kavanagh and Mirelle had a copy to sell. The same year Sue modelled the noble fur coat, Lilac, a colour trend also worn at the Worsley wedding by Elizabeth the Queen. Aged 18, Mo said she was called to model for a salon show, staying for a couple of years in La Boutique, moving to Dorothea Turner, another outlet in Hessel on the Humber foreshore near Hull. Copying famous designers with tweaks here and there was rife during this era as it is in the present day. And if you subscribe to the channel, you'll see when the Morel Fashions video is uploaded, where you can learn more about the amazing clothes and wedding dresses Morel's clients wore. In the later 60s and trained at Holt and Gray, Bunny Black, real name Brenda, worked at La Boutique and Mirabelle also, the outlet opened in Cottingham Village, which you'll hear about in the locations video. Discovered aged 13 when she was already tall and rangy, she went on to have a successful career in national beauty competitions like for Anglia TV after leaving La Boutique and Mirabelle. And in the 60s when she started was given a name a bit like Twiggy, as was the fashion at the time like The Shrimp. The La Boutique workroom she worked in had a more relaxed atmosphere, suitable for what was wanted by women of her own age and the daughters of Mirelle's clients who shopped at the salon. Rails hung with clothing and customers browsed, heading to changing rooms at the back to try and buy quickly and without fuss. With a funky, fashionable interior and less exclusive air, customers felt comfortable shopping at La Boutique in a less pressured and expensive atmosphere than the French Salon. Where do you think you would have shopped if you went to Mirelle? The Salon? The Boutique? Or both? Let us know in the comments below. By the early 70s, Holton Gray's models had become well known on Mirelle's catwalks, Jill Bradley, June Barkworth, Shirley Coates, Alma Oldfield, a white-haired older lady no longer called a matron in the era of equality, Carol Carr and Anne Hesk, who owned Hornsey Boutique The Bonnet Box, all had regular bookings. Mirelle was their favourite, said Mary, because of the cachet, the imaginative staging and beautiful clothes. The volume of in-person fashion shows required it. Until the mid-1970s, it was a continual part of selling at the House of Mirel. Fashion modelling was an ongoing business in the city far into that decade, but eventually it declined due to the expense of paying for models, said Mary. Different methods of advertising more cost-effective. 
Holton Gray and Mirel were inextricably linked from the 60s to the 70s, however, through them they supplied models for photographs, publicity and their fashion shows. Towards the end of the time Mirel was open, the job of the showroom girl changed as changes to the fashion industry took hold and in Hull as a city too. There's a distinct difference between Morel before 1970 and afterwards, partly due to the interplay between all those dynamics, which at the time some people in the fashion industry and those who lived in Hull recognised would be a permanent change. The reason why Peggy and Bill Wilson left Hull. Closing Story Street, from January 1971, customers walked past jewellery, dinner plates, luggage and cosmetics to find Mirelle at Carmichael's, the Harrods of the North, and there, after the move in December 1970, closing all previous locations, including the workrooms, Mirelle had a concession of their own, which you can find out about in the locations linked below. Mirelle at Carmichael's was on the first floor and it was all changed for the showroom too. Joining in 1968 while still at Story Street, when Jackie Weinberg left in 1972, it severed the link between most of the established showroom girls from the 50s and 60s who'd emigrated, left Hull, set up their own business or gone on to focus on the home. Similar to how the business ran in earlier years, Customers at La Boutique could browse the rails, but it still offered personal service in the salon. Ivy McQueen was Boutique's manageress by now. Rena Pittaway there too. 16-year-old Maureen Gregory joined in 1974, training as a model at Holton Gray, then leaving to work in the beauty business in 1976. Although based at La Boutique, she could cross the walkway and work either side if called upon by the senior staff like Mira Molly or Judith Tinney, the salon's first sales. Starting after the move, Judith thought she replaced Honor Dufton, the company owned by her family, selling number 11 Story Street, which you can see in the locations. Judith worked alongside junior Janet Ireland, joined by part-time staff like the cuddly Peggy Stone, who reappeared having been employed in the 60s almost a decade before. Joan, Judith's mother, worked there as well before Judith left to have a baby in the summer of 75, eventually becoming a jeweller. If she hadn't, she would have ended up in the salons of Paris, she said, Mirelle the best education to work in couture. In Carmichael's, high quality fashions without the intensive and expensive sewing to create them were long stocked on their shelves, impeccably altered by the workroom girls. I was told they had very high standards and if I wasn't prepared to roll out the red carpet, then I wouldn't be suitable, said Maureen Gregory. Such a rarefied atmosphere for a young girl. Inside Morel, the world stopped turning, retaining a class of service reminiscent of the opulent 1930s salons and rues of Paris, even when fashion for her 16-year-old friends had changed beyond recognition outside its walls. In 1977, they moved again, which you'll see in the locations video. There were far fewer people at the Centre Hotel on Paragon Street, but it was still headed by Mira, Molly and Mildred, head of the workroom, who you'll hear about in the workroom talk if you subscribe for it coming up. And as the salon and boutique became more blended, the business changed as well. After Judith and Maureen left in 1976, as did bookkeeper Betty, Janet Ireland came over to the Centre Hotel from Carmichael's, now much more than a junior and handling all showroom sales. From the boutique, Rena Pittaway and Ivy McQueen did as well, and the remaining workroom girls. But the shop was slower than beforehand. It had a smaller space to hold stock, and the business faltered as fashion moved on from the hand-picked designs of the years before. Built in 1968, and replacing the Imperial, the Centre Hotel was the most modern of all Mirelle's locations. Box-like and wide with square windows, the
The showrooms were visible at street level to all. Connected by an open doorway, the boutique and salon was open plan, making it more spacious and less traditional than any previously, a fresh start, a modern outlook. But as the year drew onwards, they noticed a difference to what had happened previously and the stock started to reduce, along with the clientele. While they were at Carmichael's, large public fashion shows ground to a halt. The last in September 76, modelling cons considered far too expensive a way of selling clothes. Profit margins and their ability to order exclusive models grew thinner and thinner as labels ceased trading, like long-standing staples Rebita Couture and Susan Small. You'll hear more about those labels and the fashion sold at Morel in the fashions video. Do you remember what it was like to shop in Hull in the 70s? Or maybe you even visited the Centre Hotel? Let us know in the comments below. Workroom girl Janet Webster, who was there at the end, said, Mirelle didn't really work at the Centre Hotel, meaning that by the mid-70s, the dynamics creating its success were reducing with every passing year. When they moved, the business was 39 years old and fashion had changed completely, as had the customer base, many of whom had left Hull like Maisie Parks or retired or died. Ten years earlier, on the 13th of June 1968, Roger Nelson, designer for Rel Dan and British couturier Digby Morton said, Designers who float around with airy-fairy ideas are not being practical. The days of couture and boutiques are dying. It's the mass manufacturers who can afford to survive. He saw what was to follow. The 60s changed fashion forever, followed by looser 70s fads and trends. Occasion wear and time of day dressing that so characterised Morel's buying strategy and method of selling, albeit disappeared, brands they relied on ran aground as well, making the 70s a reversal, a decline. Hull's economy struggled from increasing pressure. The Cod Wars with Iceland, who challenged access for British fishing trawlers around their island, won their war and cut off its lifeblood. And at the same time, the fashion industry changed forever as mass production took hold. Mirelle's waters shifted after years of success and unforeseen at the beginning of the decade, it sowed the seeds of decline in both. By 1976, shoppers drained from the city centre and the retail culture changed, replaced by fast fashion, national chains and charity shops. Young people had a new attitude. They didn't see why they should spend a fortune at La Boutique when they could get cheaper clothes at CNA, said Janet, who was at the workroom at the end. Other chain stores became more attractive to buy from, and for Maidam, Mountain and Kid, it was timely to sell up and retire in June 1978. Marvin's Fashions, who brought Morel, adopted a looser trading model than the high standards and client-focused way they'd operated, but by 1980, similar dynamics affected their business as well. Further on in her career than when she left, it was Deputy Manageress Maureen Gregory who opened Marvin's in the Centre Hotel then eventually closed their branch in 1980, which they'd bought from her old employer two years before. In the years since Mirelle closed, it is remarkable that the showroom girls have an acute recall for brands, designs, customers and occasions where clothes were worn solely from memory as if each was significant as a wedding dress or a mother of the bride outfit of their own. The showroom was more than a shop floor. It was a snapshot of the way the fashion industry worked in the heyday of couture. There, the influence of Paris, London, Rome and the culture of high-end fashion played out, a testament to the buying strategy, competence and success of the showroom girls. We've come to the end of our stories about the showroom. We really hope you've enjoyed it. But before we go, 
What do you think is the biggest difference between the way we sell and buy fashion now and how the House of Morel worked? Do let us know in the comments and please subscribe and hit the bell notification icon if you enjoyed it so that you can be told the second something new is here on this channel. Thank you for supporting us at the House of Morel Hull.